Time Warner Cable is pleased to be an underwriting sponsor for Carolina Week. Coming up on the Monday edition of Carolina Week, on the five-year anniversary of September 11th, we take a look back at our own campus that tragic day and have an update about Ground Zero today. Hispanics celebrate their heritage and learn more about what this area can offer them. Coming up in sports, first the defense falters, now the offense. Can Carolina football salvage this season? Plus, Jonathan O is here with your Carolina Week four-day forecast. All that and a tribute to Carolina alums who died on 9-11. Carolina Week starts right now. From the School of Journalism and Mass Communication at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, this is Carolina Week. Welcome to the September 11th edition of Carolina Week. I'm Katie Klein. And I'm Jessica Floyd. Like December 7th, 1941, the day the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, September 11th, 2001 is a day that will live in infamy. Tragedy tends to bring people together. Monday at noon, the UNC community reflected about the tra tragic events of September 11th and honored the UNC alumni who perished that day. Students, faculty members, and servicemen and women gathered in front of Wilson Library to remember those who lost their lives. Chapel Hill Fire Chief Dan Brown, Iraq War veteran and UNC student Chris Arndt, and event organizer Andrew Brown spoke about September 11th's unforgettable effect on the UNC campus and the nation. So, although we may not think of the, uh, the direct, directly think of the attacks of September 11th, we definitely uh, have been affected uh, as, a, as a college community. Uh, and, and I think it know, brought it really close to home just talking about Carolina and talking about how these people that passed away in September 11th, they were from around North Carolina. Duke and NC Central also held memorial services Monday to honor those who died. Some current members of the Carolina community were here on that terrible day five years ago. I spoke with two who say their lives will always be affected by the events of 9-11. Five years ago, September 11th started out like any other day on the UNC campus. I remember I was over walking back from class. I think I was coming out of English 12 and I was walking down to South Campus. And we were in physics, I recall, and the girl beside me was looking at her computer or looking at something. and. Um, she said that somebody just flew into the World Trade Center. Jim Baker, who was a freshman, and Chris Durham, a senior at the time, were like many other students that day, drawn to a TV. Everybody, especially on that day, was just wanting to know what happened. Classes didn't matter, reading didn't matter. It was very solemn. Um, I remember some people were watching it in the Union, like on the TVs in the Union, and uh, folks just gathered, gathered around, you know, trying to get in contact with their loved ones. Students supported each other. The community held a vigil in Polk Place the next day. Our country, our individual lives will be indelibly changed by the events of the last 27 hours. It was like a unifying time on campus. Nobody was really like upset with anybody else. Students grieved, even if they didn't personally know anyone in the attacks. Being on a campus this large, there was, you know, there were several people that had relatives in the Trade Center or in the Pentagon. And so, you know, that you know, you almost experience what they were experiencing vicariously. It's a time many will never forget. I think everyone's going to remember this for the rest of their lives. Like, where were you when you heard? I was over by the library. Sometimes you hear people talk about Pearl Harbor and what they were doing when they was bombed or when Kennedy was assassinated. It'll be like that. You know, I'll never forget, you know, this experience. The events of that day fresh in our minds through various presentations on the big screen. United 93 was released by Universal Pictures in April. Flight 93 is one that crashed in the field in Pennsylvania. In August, Oliver Stone's World Trade Center opened to audiences. The film depicts 9-11 through the eyes of two Port Authority police officers who were trapped in the ruins of the Twin Towers. 
Both films were acclaimed by critics for their realism, but some people think the films are too intense. Like, it looks like it's a, it's a well done movie. Like, I like Nicolas Cage and everything, but it's just like, it's absolutely too soon. If, if the movie came out maybe in five or 10 years, I would con consider going to go see it. United 93 came out on DVD last I week. World Trade Center is currently in theaters. That film documents the rescue of John McLaughlin and William Jimeno, the 18th and 19th survivors pulled from the wreckage of the World Trade Center. Ground, Ground, Ground Zero is now cleared of record, wreckage, but very little rebuilding has taken place. Alex Verrall joins us live in the newsroom with more about the controversy surrounding plans for the site. It's been five years since the planes hit, but at Ground Zero, little has changed. Bulldozers still litter the hole where the towers once stood. New York One reporter John Shumo covered the events of 9-11. Apparently there was some sort of a gas leak, uh, and it apparently is heading in our direction. He's followed the rebuilding from the start and criticizes the lack of progress. We're now approaching the five-year anniversary, and I have the same pit. Okay. at the World Trade Center site that I did in May of 2002. So is Alex not doing the so, tag? It's disappointing. No, it's disappointing as a New Yorker. It's embarrassing. How are we here five years later and there's very little accomplished? What has been the holdup? The Lower Manhattan Development Corporation chose designs for the site and the memorial in 2003. In the time since, the cornerstone of Tower 1, the Freedom Tower, was placed, then removed. Tower construction started, but then stopped because of security concerns. These money issues and family concerns, such as where the victims' names should go, also forced a redesign of the memorial. The new Seven World Trade Center is currently the only rebuilding success at the site. Charles Wolfe's connection to the rebuilding couldn't be more personal. I lost my wife that morning. We'd been married for 12 years, together for 13. Uh, and she had just started her job in the World Trade Center, had only been there two weeks. Wolfe has taken an active role in planning the memorial. He urges everyone to realize it's not about the time it takes, but about getting it right for the victims. This whole event, we kind of look at it as the buildings, and we have to come back with the reality that thousands of people died. Thousands of people, thousands of souls left this earth, and we have to remember that. Construction finally, finally began on the memorial in mid-August. Developers expect it to open on the 8th anniversary, September 11th, 2009. Once built, the Freedom Tower will rise to 1,776 feet, making it the tallest building in the world. Some worry this will attract another terrorist attack. We all know Facebook has taken college campuses by storm. But some people say the latest features have gone too far. Coming up, we'll show you the new face of Facebook. There is really only one boy. One girl. One tree. One forest. One deep dancing ocean. One mountain calling. One handful of sand through our fingers. One endless sky overhead. And one simple way to care for it all. Please visit earthshare.org and learn how the world's leading environmental groups are working together under one name, Earthshare. One environment, one simple way to care for it. For 12 years, La Fiesta del Pueblo has brought the many cultures of Latin America to thousands of North Carolinians. Jennifer Carpenter has the story. 
La Fiesta del Pueblo is one of the largest Latin American fairs in North Carolina. Fiesta del Pueblo in, in general is just awesome. They have food and dancing and it's just a way, you know, there's a big festival like this. It kind of is just a fun way to just participate and be proud of your heritage and where you're from. But there's more to this summer event than just fun and games. A large element to La Fiesta is its concentration on public service and human rights. La Fiesta del Pueblo is the perfect opportunity for Latin American speakers to learn about the health and human services available to them in North Carolina. By sending Spanish-speaking representatives, groups are able to give information to Latinos who are often unreachable through traditional promotion. It's a great way to get information out to a community that doesn't normally, isn't the most proactive about getting that information. Social service groups, such as the North Carolina Society for Hispanic Professionals, take advantage of La Fiesta to notify Latinos of educational tools that can benefit their families. Uh, so the Fiesta del Pueblo is a, is a way for us to outreach our own community and uh, basically bring in the message that the education is important. Because it promotes a healthy lifestyle, education, and good citizenship, La Fiesta del Pueblo is more than just a cultural exhibit. It's a cultural experience. At the State Fairgrounds, I'm Jennifer Carpenter. Carolina Week. Thanks, Jen. La Fiesta del Pueblo is organized by El Pueblo, a Latino advocacy group based in Raleigh. It's the largest Latin American festival in the Carolinas. Students can usually get into the football games with a UNC One card. That wasn't enough at Saturday's Virginia Tech game. Tickets were required. Students lined up at gate five of Keenan Stadium, armed with printed tickets they received through the Carolina Athletic Association's new online ticket distribution. The CAA used the game to test out the new system before it's utilized for the basketball season. In order to obtain tickets, you must create an account on tarheelblue.com and register for the distribution. Freshman Stephanie fin Finkbinder says the new system is convenient. I think it's pretty easy because like everything that is, um, everything's becoming more technological these days and everybody's online anyway so you might as well do it while you can and um, I think it's probably less hectic than coming here and trying to just like sort out who's going to get in and who's not. The upcoming NC State game is the final football game with an online distribution. Although the walk from South Campus can be long and grueling, many students find it easier than braving the crowded buses. With the opening of the new on-campus apartments behind Hinton James and Craig residence halls, the number of students living on South Campus has increased significantly. In order to accommodate these students, transportation officials have created a new bus line called the SU. Although the SU won't hit every South Campus bus stop, it will serve the major hubs. Tired of waiting at the bus stop all the time? UNC has funded a new program to address that frustration. University officials collaborated with a company called NextBus to install global positioning satellites at bus stops across campus, which will track the location of a bus. The system also gives students an estimate of when a particular bus is set to arrive at any given stop. Students can access this information by logging onto Chapel Hill's transportation website. Freshman Caitlin Tucker likes the idea. By the spring, university officials hope to have set up monitors and selected bus stops to display the satellite information. The entire program, the social networking website Facebook, is causing some more controversy in the wake of a new feature. The news feed takes updated information from friends' profiles and places it on the member's homepage. The information that now shows up ranges from what new groups your friends join to alerting users to changing in a, profile, a person's relationship status. Many students don't like the new feature. It's all out there anyway, but I don't know. I think this is just too much. I, don't, I, don't, I really don't even want to know that much about my friends. <laughs> Facebook creator Mark Zuckerberg issued a letter of apology to users saying Facebook overlooked privacy issues and would remedy the problem immediately. A new set of features ensures users' privacy and gives individuals more control of what's available to the public. 
And uh, temperatures have gone down a little lately, so. They have. It's that time of year where you don't know whether to bring a jacket or sunscreen. I know, and it's going to keep you guessing. In fact, on Monday, we saw temperatures that were really nice. People enjoyed what could be the start of fall temperatures, but will the summer weather sneak back in, or is fall here to stay? I'll have the answer coming up. Awaken your creativity. Do your thing at the art school at the Art Center in Carborough. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll put that out. Of course, we saw cooler temperatures for the past few days, and it's going to keep you guessing. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Carolina Week. I'm Jonathan O, and hope you're having a safe September 11th. In fact, we're going to take a look at the weather headlines. We're going to expect a nice Tuesday. The temperatures are going to, again, be in the 80s. Some areas saw 70s, and it was kind of cool. But by midweek, we expect showers to come into our area. And the temperatures, again, we'll keep you guessing, we'll be seeing temperatures in the 70s and 80s. Now, if we take a look at the southeastern radar and composite view, we see some of the rains down here into the Gulf of Mexico. A lot of the rain is present here on the upper left-hand section of your screen. This is all in advance of a front. In fact, if we look at the national satellite view, we see this entire stream of rain and clouds. This is a low pressure system. If we look at the surface map, we can see that this is a low pressure system. And a lot of those greens and the reds and, and a lot of rain is just in the area. Now, we've got this hurricane uh, Florence is starting, uh, spinning out there over Bermuda, but again, it won't affect our weather. In fact, if you look at future view, we've got low pressure system and that cold front. This is, this is a view of the 24-hour forecast. So again, not close enough to our area to see any type of rain for tomorrow. But by Wednesday, we see this cold front pushing even closer, and now we see some of those green areas. So we're going to be expecting some rain by then. If you're traveling to any of the September 11th location for the next couple of days, a lot of the temperatures look in the 70s for New York City, Washington, D.C., and in Shanksville. The chance of rain will actually start out over in Shanksville because of that front. It will be pushing toward the east. And then by Wednesday, most of the other locations will be seeing rain as well. So for our Monday evening, partly cloudy skies. It should be very nice. A nice breeze will be outside, and our low will be around 62 degrees. In fact, we take a look at the street. It looks very nice. And then for the next four days, this is what we'll be expecting. A chance of rain again on Wednesday and Thursday. The highs will be in the 70s, and the lows will be in the 50s and 60s. And then we're going to be seeing that cool off coming back to warmer temperatures by Friday, and our highs will be back into the mid-80s, and lows will be in the mid-60s. So hope you uh, enjoy and take advantage of the nice weather, except for the midweek, because it will be rainy. Well, it sounds like overall some very good weather for football season. Thanks so much, Jonathan O. And sportscaster Ryan Ball is here to tell us how the season is shaping up for the Tar Heels. You know, it's funny. He says fall. All I can think is the heels getting back out there on the gridiron. <laughs> but coming up in sports, Shoddy defense and turnovers on offense have doomed the football heels to an 0-2 start. Now the boys in blue need to turn over a new leaf to right the ship. Two hundred years ago, Lewis and Clark set out to discover an all-water route to the Pacific. But what they really discovered in themselves and everyone they encountered, a 
are qualities we can still learn from today. the Lewis and Clark Bicentennial. We invite you to walk with them at lewisandclark200.org and see what you discover, because their trail winds through us all. Welcome to Carolina Week Sports. I'm Ryan Ball. If it weren't for soccer and field hockey, some people might wonder if we play fall sports around here at all. Many people have already forgotten Saturday's 35 to 10 drubbing by Virginia Tech, but now it's Coach Bunting's job to learn from the team mistakes and get ready for Furman. Reporter Brian Allen has the analysis of Saturday's game. Statistically, Carolina seemingly played well against Virginia Tech. The Heels outgained the Hokies offensively, dominating the time of possession by almost nine minutes. After giving up over 200 yards rushing against Rutgers, the defense clamped down, limiting Virginia Tech to just nine first downs and only two third down conversions. But then there were the turnovers. Starting quarterback Joe Daly tossed two INTs that were returned deep into Tar Heel territory. Cam Sexton was brought out to cheers in the second quarter, but soon lost the crowd's favor by throwing another two picks. In each occasion, uh, there was something that took place that took uh, either receiver or the quarterback's eyes off the target. And we got to do a better job functioning. It's all about functioning out there in, in, the, in the pocket, knowing where to go with the ball, what coverage it is, what you saw pre-snap, and then, we, then what you see post-snap. Make better decisions, make better throws. A blocked David Woldridge punt also led to another hokey touchdown. Still, the Heels had a chance to compete with Virginia Tech. A first quarter Connor Barth field goal gave Carolina their only lead of the game, and a fumble recovery on the next drive gave the Heels great field position. Two or three plays in the game you know, can ultimately uh, determine the outcome of it, and we had opportunity after opportunity to make those plays and, and kind of really get up on those guys, and, and, and you know, we, had our, we had our foot on their throats. We just didn't, we didn't, we didn't hammer it down. We didn't, we didn't put them completely out. It's unfortunate that we just didn't make uh, enough plays and, and uh, do enough right things to make it a, a different game in the first half. But you still have the second half to play also. And uh, to give up any team you know, 14 points on two yards of total offense uh, is always disappointing. From Chapel Hill, I'm Brian Allen, Carolina Week Sports. Despite the rough start to the season and an overall 13 and 22 mark for this year's seniors, the team is uniting under a new rally cry. Anywhere you look in Chapel Hill, you can see it's time for another Carolina football season. However, in recent years, the football program has not been a source of pride for Tar Heel sports fans. That's why UNC senior linebacker Larry Edwards coined a news phrase for the players and fans this, to rally around, the new blue. Edwards explains what that means. Let's be that new team that dominates, that goes out, plays hard together. Let's be that team that has fun, that enthusiasm, has the crowd into it, it just brings a whole new type of cultures to Carolina period. The men's soccer team had an up and down week. Wednesday's game against NC State ended in defeat for the number one ranked Heels 3 to 1. But Carolina bounced back to top Liberty on Saturday 1 to nothing. The women's soccer team had a bit more success beating Washington 4 to zip and defending national champion Portland 1 to nothing to win the Nike Portland Invitational. It's been a rough start of the season for the women's volleyball team. The Carolina volleyball team lost a tough match against undefeated Illinois Friday night. Although the Fighting Illini charged through Carolina in three straight games, the fans helped keep the heels, helped the heels keep all three games very close. It's a lot of support out there. During the first game, Illinois and UNC were tied 15 times and had eight lead changes. Illinois won 30 to 28 and took the second game 35 to 33. The Heels stayed positive and fought through the third and final game, but fell 26 to 30. Carolina's season record dropped to one and six. Carolina looked to rally early in 
rallying the early game on Saturday against the College of Charleston. Noel Dick from the outside. Charleston wasn't backing down, dominating the net over the shorter Tar Heels. Ooh, can't get that one by. After dropping the first two games, Coach Joe Segula not too happy with his players. Maybe it's time for him to pass off some pointers. Freshman Megan Owens with a sweet touch of the net, and despite the rally, the Heels couldn't break through the Charleston defense. Heels lose in four games. Fast forward to the second game on Saturday. Wichita State coming into Carmichael. This cross-court spike isn't coming back. The Heels drop to an early 2-0 deficit and continue to have more than a few problems on defense. Ouch. Coach Segula again, hopefully with a little more advice for his team. Apparently the Heels got the message and rallied back in the third game. First the sweet drop shot, and then the Carolina Classic, Amy Beavers from the side with the spike. Even the defense came back for the rally as the Heels win their final three games to take the match. We were just sick of losing. We've struggled the past couple tournaments. Uh, we really wanted to win, and we knew we had to play together and you know, play harder, too. and so we tried to put those into play here, and it seemed to work out tonight. Well, thanks, Ryan, for that uh, update on the sports going on in North Carolina. My pleasure. All right. Each year on September 11th, people read the names of thousands who died, but six mean an extra special something to UNC. When we come back, a special tribute to the Carolina alums who lost their lives in 9-11. Yes, sir. Uh, found these over by the stairs. Okay, thank you. What are they? Love handles. Lots of people lose them taking the stairs instead of the escalator. If you have a story idea, contact Carolina Week at 843-8292. You can also visit us online at carolinaweek.org. If you have questions about this program, write Carolina Week at Campus Box 3365, UNCCH, Chapel Hill, North Carolina, 27599. Normally at this point in our newscast, we bring you a light, feel-good type of piece. We call this, in the business, a kicker. But on the anniversary of the 9-11 attacks, that just didn't seem appropriate to us. Instead, we'd like to remind you of the six Carolina alums who died on that day. Carlton Fife was from Durham. He graduated from Carolina in 1992 with degrees in economics and philosophy. He was aboard American Flight 11, the plane that hit the North Tower. Mary Lou Haig came to Carolina from Parkersburg, West Virginia. She graduated in 1996 with a degree in business administration. She worked on the 89th floor of the South Tower. Ryan Cohart grew up on Long Island. And Andrew King was from Elgin, Illinois. He graduated from Carolina in 1983 with a degree in political science. He was a trader for Cantor Fitzgerald and was also in the World Trade Center during the 93 terrorist attack. Ryan Cohart grew up on Long Island. He graduated from Carolina in 1998 with a degree in political science and was the captain of the lacrosse team. He worked on the 104th floor of the North Tower. Dora Minchaka, originally from San Antonio, Texas, was a research scientist who graduated from UNC in 1978 with a master's in public health. She was aboard Flight 77 that crashed into the Pentagon. Chris Quackenbush was from Bay Shore, North New York. He graduated from Carolina with a degree in political science in 1979. He was on the fourth floor when the second plane hit the South Tower. And we'd like to extend our greatest sympathies for the families that um, were involved with September 11th. Yes, it will def definitely be a day that no one will forget. That does it for this edition of Carolina Week. Have a good night.